I think most humans have in them the capacity to, co to commit murder. Uh, it is no, not because... No, we don't, Richard. Uh, they, they choose not to, not because they are morally superior, as they so commonly claim, but because they are imprisoned in a web of responsibilities, commitments, no, beliefs, and sentiments. Richard, Richard. And that would render murder an absurd gamble or ridiculous well, self-destruction. Did you kill 13 people? It would be improper for me to comment on my LA convictions and on my pending case here in San Francisco. Why? Because of my appeals. Are you appealing these because you say you're innocent? You didn't kill 13 people? That is correct. You didn't kill 13 people? Again, it would be improper for me to comment in any regard to that question. A lot was made that you're a devil worshiper. Do you worship the devil? Have you ever studied Satanism? <sighs> there are different sects of Satanism. Have you studied, just yes or no, have you studied yes, Satanism? Yes, I have. Are you, are you a worshiper of the devil? No comment. Come on, Richard. We're I can tell you a little bit about Satanism. Well, I'm, I'm interested in hearing what you got to say then. It is undefiled wisdom instead of hypocritical self-deceit. <sighs> it is power, power without charity. A Satanist admits to being evil. Do you admit to being evil, Richard? We are all evil in some form or another, are we not? I'm asking you the questions, my friend. <laughs> Yes, I am evil. Not 100%, but I am evil. Evil has always existed. Now that's one way to start a video. What you just heard are actual gunshots. Because where I'm standing at right now in Elysian Park overlooking Los Angeles is actually right next door to the LAPD Police Academy. And they're doing some training over there, obviously. But welcome to Los Angeles. Now, before we get started and get deep into the locations of the capture of serial killer Richard Ramirez, doesn't this place look familiar to you? We've, we were here in the past, we did a video. This is where they filmed the nuclear explosion scene from Terminator 2 where Linda Hamilton is at the fence and she's shaking the fence. It's got this, it's the dream sequence and the children in the playground get consumed by the nuclear blast. Wild, right? Well, today's Grim Adventure is all about one of America's scariest serial killers, a man by the name of Richard Ramirez, the Night Stalker, a monster who terrorized the city of Los Angeles in the mid 80s and was caught in East L.A. As we told you earlier, the man believed to be the walk-in killer was caught through the efforts of some very alert and very involved citizens. Elizabeth Anderson reports the residents of Boyle Heights are very proud of their heroic efforts. Earlier today, the residents here on Hubbard Street were filled with fear. Not anymore. Now the streets are filled with excitement. That's because the walk-in killer prime suspect was captured on Hubbard Street this morning. As soon as the word got out, hundreds of curious onlookers drove past the neighborhood. None of them could believe the prime suspect had been arrested in their own backyard. Manuel de la Torre is being called a hero. He ran to his wife's rescue today when he saw another man hitting his wife while pulling her out of her gold Granada. That's when Torres grabbed a lead pipe and began hitting that man, who eventually turned out to be the prime walking killer suspect. De La Torres tells his story as his friend Robert Alvarez translates. A lot of people think he's a hero. How does he feel about that? No. No, not a hero? No. Like a hero. De La Torres was protecting his wife Angie De La Torres, who was still filled with fear. Faustino Pignon is another hero in this neighborhood. Earlier today, he chased after the same suspect after he claims Ramirez was trying to steal his red Mustang. And even though he says he was being threatened with a gun, Pignon fought that suspect anyway. And then I got him by the neck. Got him by the neck, and then what? Then we struggled back and forth in the car. He was going forward and back with the car. 
Maria Marijo's face tells her story. She is still filled with shock because it was her daughter, Angie de la Torre, who was accosted in her own car by Ramirez. She knows her daughter's all right now. And now Hubbard Street is filled with excitement. The residents here share the feelings of so many others. They say they can walk the streets again. They can sleep safely in their homes at night. And that is welcome news. Elizabeth Anderson, Channel 4 News, Boyle Heights. Now before we visit the street where the Night Stalker was beaten and captured, we have to take a step back. You see, August 31st, 1985, Richard Ramirez steps off a bus here in Los Angeles. He's returning from visiting his brother in Tucson, Arizona. And when he does this, he has no idea that the police have released a sketch. And they put it on all of the newspapers here in Los Angeles in hopes to kind of draw him out. And the police are actually waiting at the bus station thinking that seeing this, he might try to flee. So they're sitting there watching and waiting for Ramirez to show up. And he doesn't because he's actually returning to Los Angeles and not leaving. Now, the story goes that once he got off the bus, he was walking and he went into a liquor store at 819 South Town Avenue. There's a liquor store called Mike's Liquor Store. And he picked up a newspaper, he saw his face on the newspaper, he dropped it and he took off running. Yeah, you look at the the picture of the newspaper. You look at it, it looks uh, really, really scary, you know? The reason I say the story goes is because in doing research and trying to track down the address of Mike's liquor store, I came across two different articles that say that this is the liquor store, the store that Richard Ramirez walked in and saw his picture on the newspaper. The first one being from an actual article that stated 819 South Towns Avenue, which would put it right here. Mike's Liquor Store is long gone, and today it's JB Textiles. Now again, the address to this place actually came from an old newspaper article, and I'm going to go ahead and put that image of the newspaper article like, scanned in right here in the video so you can see what I'm talking about. But like I said, in doing research, I came across another place, and I have to say it's a little bit more disturbing and a little bit more believable. I mean, maybe he stopped at both places. So again, Mike's liquor store would have been right there where JB Textiles is, 819 South Town Avenue. And after seeing his picture in the newspaper, Richard Ramirez would have ran out the door down this street. And according to where he was caught, this intersection right here is Town and 8th Street. He would have made a right and continued running down, hopping over a freeway through backyards and all the way over to Hubbard Street. But before we get there, we got a couple other, a couple other sites to visit. What you're looking at right now is a market known as A&E Ramirez Market. Trust me, it's a strange coincidence. It has nothing to do with Richard Ramirez, but back in 85, Ramirez ran down this street from left to right, and there was a newsstand, like newspapers, right where those praying hands are, and there's a picture of the owner of the newsstand at the time saying that Ramirez actually stole a newspaper after he saw his face on it. So I never actually found the address of this place in any of the police files, just the corner of Evergreen and 8th Street. Ramirez would have been coming right down the sidewalk like we are doing right now towards the intersection of Evergreen and 8th. And that picture pretty much lines up to right about here he would have saw his face on the newspaper right at the newsstand right next to those praying hands. And you can see the trees down the sidewalk, all of that line up. The building's changed a little bit, but this is it. Now I wanna point out that the newspaper in this photo is different from other newspapers that I've seen from police reports. So I'm guessing, what appears to me is that as he was running, he was seeing his face plastered all over newspapers as he was trying to flee and get away from people who was recognizing him. I'm actually a little blown away that there's a Richard Ramirez crime scene location, if you will, that actually says Ramirez Market on it. Didn't expect that, and I had no idea that it was like this until I was doing some Google Street View research, and I saw it and I almost lost my mind. 
No, of course, I went inside and I asked the owners, the current owners, if they knew anything about this, and it came as a complete shock to them. They had no idea that this is actually part of the story. And the name, they said they don't know where it came from. It was probably from one of the previous owners. And it's not a very uncommon name, Ramirez, especially here in East LA, Los Angeles. So the tie is completely coincidental. Now keep in mind, all of this is within blocks of Ramirez Market. And Richard Ramirez is running through the neighborhood, zigzagging through yards, and people are recognizing him, and he's trying to get away. And a police report comes in that Ramirez is seen here at the intersection of Euclid and Garnett Street. And they send, I think it's like seven police cars out this way. Leaving Ramirez Market and following Evergreen Avenue up about two blocks, it doesn't really dead end. Instead, it kind of curves over to the left. But you can see that that concrete wall up there. And the other side of that is I-5. Now, Ramirez, still running, he runs up the embankment over top I-5 into the neighborhood on the other side, and he's seen two more times. This dividing wall that separates the highway from the neighborhood looks relatively new. And to be honest, I'm not sure if there was actually a wall there back whenever Ramirez ran across the highway, but it does state in the reports that Ramirez did run across I-5 into the neighborhood on the other side. And that's where we're going now. When Ramirez made his way over here to Hubbard Street, he tried to steal a car from a man who was living at this address right here, 3751 Hubbard Street. His name was Faustino. And Ramirez and Faustino wrestled, but uh, Ramirez eventually gave up. He didn't get the car, and instead he ran across the street. He didn't get that far, where he tried to steal another car where there was a woman trying to get into it. And from what I gather, he punched her in the stomach and she fought him and she was screaming for her husband to come out and help her. And he came out and he grabbed a fence post like a metal bar and hit Ramirez over the head. Now I tried really hard to try to track down where that car was parked. All I know is it's across the street somewhere. Somewhere right over here. Jeez, give me the keys, give me the keys. And then I looked up at his face and I saw his eyes and then I recognized that he was the one who killed. That's when Manuel de la Torre got involved. Manuel ran out front. He got a metal stick from, the, from right there from the gate, hit him in the head. I gave him one by the car, the man fell. He started running away. I chased him, then I gave him another hit. The blow from the lead pipe knocked Ramirez to the ground, but he got up and he ran. And he didn't make it that far because at this point, all the commotion, everybody was coming out of the houses. And I mean, the community really band together. And they pretty much beat the living heckins out of Ramirez. And it was right about here in this area. Again, it's really hard to kind of pinpoint everything, but from everything I found online, somewhere where this property meets this property, I see this black fence and then the white fence. But it looks like they finally subdued him right here. And he was a bloody mess. Whenever the police eventually came, he had, and he, he was bloody. He, I mean, he was bloody. And from what I've read, the people who are living here, the community, had Ramirez sitting here on the curb, waiting. And they had no idea who he was. The guy came at me with a, a piece of iron bar. And he hit me once over the head. I turned around and he swung it again and he hit me on the wrist. And at that point, I couldn't run anymore. I sat down to take a breather, and I saw a sheriff's patrol car coming down the street, and I knew that, you know, my life was over. Whenever the police got here, a news reporter showed up and was, was able to record and film everything. Now, it's important to remember that while this happened, the entire city was being terrorized by Richard Ramirez. Nobody knew where he was going to strike next. Nobody knew who he was going to strike next. They just knew that this monster was on the prowl. And in a time where the entire city was kind of crippled with fear, this community, this street, the people who lived here just kind of band together and, and took care of everything. They, they took care of their own. 
He said something in Spanish about, uh, I'm lucky the cops are coming or something. Because he knew that we were going to, everybody was going to finish. When the police showed up and eventually arrested, basically, the car thief, they had absolutely no idea who they had. And I always found it quite unnerving that the reporter, you can see in his video, Ramirez is sitting in the back seat. His head is all bandaged up because the people here on Hubbard Street beat the crap out of him. But they ask him, you know, what's your name? Have you ever been arrested before? And he just doesn't answer him. And he just sits there in the back of the car. Crazy, right? Never been arrested before in LA? Four, fourth one down. Because of the reporter that was on scene and shot video, we know that the squad car that held Ramirez in the back seat was parked right about here, just to the left of this white one on the right-hand side, which is directly across from where the people of the street were holding him. Now, you see this house right here? You can see that in the shot as well, with Ramirez in the back seat, and off in the distance, you can see that house, the, the slope of the roof, everything. For the most part, the houses have remained the same. There's a few changes here and there. But just watching it and walking the street, you can, you can piece together the news report. You can see this house, both these houses. He got a metal stick from, the, from right there from the gate, hit him in the head. I gave him one by the car, the man fell, he started running away, I chased him. Now this one's gonna be a little hard to see because of the sun, but back to Faustino's house, where Ramirez tried to steal the Mustang. If we look across the street, like directly across the street from it, there are three houses, and I know I'm pointing the camera directly into the sun, but these three houses right here, can be seen. Like there's an aerial shot that looks down on them and it matches up perfectly. Also in the aerial shot, you can see that building right there. It says 3757. And if I pan the camera over this way, 3754, there's a news clip where you can see people in this house right here. You can see 3754 in the shot. This building has changed a little bit, but I'm wondering if right in front of here, right over this way, is where the second car was that Ramirez tried to steal. Almost kind of where that Tesla is. So it was either further up near where that garbage truck is or back this way because you can see this house. The guy came at me with a, a piece of iron bar. And he hit me once over the head. I turned around and swung it again. I think that's about it for our time here on Hubbard Street. I still have a few questions, like where exactly was that second car that Ramirez tried to break into and steal? But for the most part, it really took getting here and just walking the street to kind of understand what everything, what, what happened that day. I did run into a few of the people that live here and nobody that I talked to was living here when that happened. Well, I take that back. There was one woman who was whistling, and I don't know if she's gonna be watching this, but if you do, it was very beautiful. And uh, it's pretty surreal, pretty surreal. From here, we're heading over to the police station where Ramirez was taken once he was arrested. After Ramirez was arrested, he was taken to the Hollenbeck Police Station, which is this building right here. Well, this is the new one. The old one, the original one, was actually torn down and they built this one in its place. But what we want to look at is right back here towards the back of it, there is a concrete wall. Now, I, I highly doubt this is the original concrete wall. But whenever he was arrested and he was brought here, crowds knew that the Night Stalker was caught, so they all came over here to try to catch a glimpse of him. 
Yeah, I can tell from just looking at it. It's not the original wall. It hasn't been resurfaced or refurbished. But this is where it was. Very similar. We did a video in New York City on David Berkowitz. Very similar situation. That's pretty wild for sure. Even though the original Hollenbeck police station is long gone, we can actually still line up a rather interesting shot that was taken after Ramirez was arrested. Uh, after he was arrested, Mayor Tom Bradley was photographed walking into the building. So the entrance would have been right over here. And to the back of the mayor were these buildings on the other side of the street. The photo was taken from right about here. And in it, you can see those buildings across the street as the mayor walks towards Hollenbeck Police Station. Really not much has changed. I mean, some paint jobs, there's a tree there. It's pretty wild to like go back in time and just see that. When Jessica and I moved to Los Angeles in January 2021, we were staying with a friend for a month. And during that time, we were making YouTube videos and also looking for an apartment. And January 13th of that year, Netflix released a documentary called Night Stalker, The Hunt for a Serial Killer, right while we were looking for apartments in Los Angeles. And I have to say, growing up and being a lover of true crime, you know, the stories, I knew a lot about Richard Ramirez, but that documentary scared me. And the very first apartment that we looked at was the first floor, and I couldn't get this documentary and the story of Richard Ramirez out of my head. Needless to say, we didn't take that first floor apartment. We actually took one in a different building and the furthest from the ground in the corner away from everybody. But it just kind of sticks with me. And after doing this video, knowing about Richard Ramirez and the crimes, being able to stand on the street, Hubbard Street, where he was beaten and caught, arrested, and the nightmare ended here in Los Angeles for families because of some people that were living there, these families. That was probably the most surreal part of this. Coming to this cemetery to end the video really wasn't planned. It was just close to where all of this happened, but it's kind of fitting because when we started this video, we started at um, Elysian Park, where they filmed a very iconic scene from Terminator 2. This is where they filmed a scene from A Nightmare on Elm Street. The church is right over there. There's a funeral happening right now, so I don't want to get too close, but that's the church right, right there. Fun little grim life, red arrow. Time to go, honey. And with that being said, thank you for joining us on another grim adventure, this time telling the story of the day Richard Ramirez was caught. Till next time, happy Halloween. Wherever I come, I've had luck. It's come my way. Wherever I go, hard luck. His daddy stays. Good luck never stays a day. A bad luck's always a common